Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lazarus and Dr. Rifkin. Uh, good morning, my name is Eric Rifkin. And first and foremost, we would like to thank the Alliance uh, for uh, being able to participate in this event. It's a, it's a special event, this seminar, and, and we're honored to be, uh, to be asked to, to speak. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about practical ways to facilitate doctor-patient uh, communication. And what we're not going to be talking about is uh, a conceptual and theoretical uh, presentation uh, but rather, uh, we are going to be talking about practical and pragmatic approaches designed to improve shared decision-making. Uh, further, we're going to explain how effective visual aids can improve care and reduce cost. We're going to provide specific examples of how this works, and perhaps more, most importantly, we're going to demonstrate how you can facilitate doctor-patient communication and reduce over-treatment. Uh, what we're going to do is show you a, vid a video, initially, a video which many of you might have seen on the Alliance website. As soon as I get it up here, okay. Um, but we think it, it summarizes what we're doing, what our uh, perspective is, what our approach is, and why what we're doing might be of interest to all of you in the audience. So if I could ask uh, somebody to start the video. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, um, that video. It's uh, been well received in, in, in other venues, and I think it uh, summarizes uh, our story and, and our approach. It does raise a number of questions, however, and, and one is what is shared decision-making and patient-centered care, and how can decision aids improve doctor-patient communication and reduce over-treatment, and what is the difference between absolute and relative risks and benefits? And under uh, absolute risks and benefits, um, are, is underlined because we think that's a primary reason why overtreatment exists, why harm exists, why low value care exists. Most information that's reported is in relative terms and we believe that's a, a totally inappropriate way to go. In terms of shared decision making, I, I believe that the definition that Cheryl gave earlier today is probably better than what I'm going to say, but nevertheless, it's up here so I'm, I'm going to say it. And it basically is a collaborative process that allows providers and patients to make decisions together. It takes into account the best clinical evidence and it considers patient values and preferences. And that's important because today, uh, patient values and preferences are, are usually given short shrift and are not given a sufficient consideration as all of you know. So, so why share decision making? Well, ethically it's the right thing to do. If, if a patient is being uh, given a drug or is having surgery uh, or any other kind of medical intervention, he or she deserves to be involved in that decision. And we define it as perfected informed consent. Uh, we believe that's also uh, self-explanatory, but true nevertheless. And it can impact the quality and cost and safety of healthcare delivery. So without shared decision-making, <coughs> quality is reduced, cost is increased, and safety of healthcare delivery is, is also reduced. The big question today is, is it working? And I'm taking a phrase from a JAMA article I wrote recently, and the answer is, while high value care has been adopted as a professional responsibility, the story of how this is implemented in practice is yet to unfold. And that's unfortunate, but there are a lot of reasons for it. This is one of the reasons. Uh, there was a review of 48 studies involving 13,000 doctors. That's a lot of doctors, a lot of anything. 10% accurately estimated risks and benefits. That's a scary number when you go to a doctor and you're hoping your doctor is uh, one of the, um, not one of the, is, is one of the 10%, not one of the 90%. And most overestimated benefit and underestimated harm. And that's a very scary thing as well. And that's true also because relative risks rather than absolute risks are used in characterizing health benefits and risks by physicians. Low value care either does not improve outcome or causes harm as you all know and often expensive procedures and hospital stays and unnecessary tests are involved and this is 
this is something that is specialists derive more often than not. There's a poor understanding of numbers and math, not only among patients, but among physicians as well. And patients and doctors do not have access to accurate data they can understand. Pharmaceutical companies, the media, and most medical journals present information using relative values. And I'm emphasizing relative values again because Dr. Lazarus and I believe <clears throat> that this is the primary problem associated with how information is communicated. Relative risk should not be used as the basis of shared decision making. And when people talk about shared decision making today, that's often the case. And every doctor should be aware of the difference between absolute and relative values. And that is not the case. And relative risk is just another way of lying according to uh, uh, Dr. Sousa, who was written up in a recent article in Atlantic Monthly uh, this year. Now, we won't say that it's lying, but what we will say is it comes pretty close. It, it, it mischaracterizes actual benefits of risk, and it doesn't benefit uh, patients, it doesn't benefit doctors, it doesn't benefit hospitals, it does benefit uh, the pharmaceutical companies on, on occasion. And so what I'd like to do is, is show you another video. This was in Kaiser Health News and NPR, and it, was, uh, it talks about what we're doing, and it, it explains rather clearly and simply what the difference between absolute and relative values are. Doctors write billions of prescriptions every year for pills and tests. This cuts your chances of a heart attack by 12%. They might tell you, but what does that really mean? Physician Andrew Lazarus and environmental scientist Eric Rifkin want to show that many common drugs and procedures have only small benefits, and they hope to do it with hardly any math or numbers. For example, we often hear regular mammograms reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer by 20%. But how many lives do mammograms really save? To answer that question, Lazarus and Rifkin want us to picture a theater full of a thousand people. Imagine every person in the theater is a woman getting regular mammograms. Now, imagine everybody whose lives are saved by those mammograms walks out of the theater. Only one in a thousand? How can the benefit be so tiny? It turns out that even regular mammograms miss some deadly cancers and some tumors prove fatal even with early detection. At the same time, as many as half those women in the theater receiving regular mammograms over a lifetime will receive false positive results, suggesting there may be cancer when there isn't. 64 women in the theater will get sometimes painful biopsies to check non-cancerous lumps. 10 out of the 1,000 women will receive treatment, including radiation and surgery, for lumps that never would have caused a problem. But what about that 20% risk reduction for mammograms? That's the one woman in the theater whose life is saved. Out of 1,000 women who don't get mammograms, about five will die of breast cancer. Out of 1,000 women who do get mammograms, about four will die anyway. The difference is one life saved out of the five, or 20%. That benefit looks a lot less substantial when it's illustrated with a theater. Some patients who think of the mammogram theater decide they want the screening anyway. Many, however, say no. But the guys say they aren't pressuring patients to avoid pills and tests. They just want people to have a realistic idea of the pros and cons. Does that uh, make sense to most of you? Uh, did, uh, did this video clearly differentiate the difference between relative and absolute risk, and can you see why these differences in numbers are, are so dramatic. And, and that dramatic difference is, 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 the, is responsible for most of the problems um, associated with overtreatment. And, and just for a moment, uh, talking about overcoming uh, the barriers, I, I, I thought I would quote uh, a, no, a recent Nobel laureate uh, who, who wrote a nice song and say the answer is blowing in the wind. And it sort of is blowing in the wind, it just hasn't come down to earth yet. We, we sort of know what we have to do uh, to increase shared decision making, uh, but we're really not doing it. And we're, we're, we're brushing it off as if it were uh, something that can uh, not be dealt with for long periods of time. Not, not the case, unfortunately. And so what we know from reading the literature and reading uh, literature reviews 
of shared decision making and, and uh, decision aids that can help people make decisions is that the information should be presented to patients in a format that has no math or numbers, and that's something we attempted to do, and that both risks and benefits have to be presented so that, that patients can understand uh, exactly what they should do and when they shouldn't do it, again, based on their preferences and values. And the format should be a clear, straightforward graphic. We believe the theater is that, and it should use only absolute values. And they also found that the number of risks and benefits uh, were best suited to a denominator of 1,000. Looking at out in absolute terms, two out of 1,000, four out of 1,000, three out of 1,000, seems to resonate more quickly. And again, these are, are not our conclusions. These are conclusions you can find in the, in the peer-reviewed journals. Our, our theater happens to fit that, and it just happened to be a little bit by, uh, by good luck and, and, and intuition. So you, what we were thinking of is producing a universal decision aid that effectively places benefit and risk information in a familiar format. And we can't emphasize the importance of that. A, a theater allows people to see themselves in the theater or see themselves at church or in synagogues or see themselves in a stadium. And they can, they can sort of get a sense of, of what the risks are and benefits are and how it, how it relates uh, to them. So we figure with a seating capacity of 1,000, as you've seen, a hypothetical theater would make it easy to illustrate health benefits and risks. And the theater is called a benefit risk characterization theater. That's at least what we call it. And there, here's a picture of a theater of, of exactly 1,000 seats. And there's no math involved. When some of these seats are, are blackened, there's no arithmetic involved. Uh, there are 1,000 seats. It uses absolute values. And again, it's something familiar that people can relate to. So how, do, how does that work, and, and, and why does it work? And let me start with smoking. Uh, em employers certainly are interested in reducing the level of smoking uh, from, from members of their organization. And so let's say someone comes in and you say, you know, Joe, uh, you should really cut down on your smoking because it's problematic for us and problematic to you. And there was a study done in the middle 60s that dealt with smokers over 25 years compared to smokers, compared to individuals who did not smoke for that period of time. And we found that there were 198 extra deaths of heart disease, lung cancer, pulmonary disease among that group that smoked. And so when the individual leaves the room, this is pretty much what happens. He doesn't really remember, or she doesn't remember the numbers, they don't really know what's going on, and they can't really see the concern associated with smoking unless they see something like this. And this is one of our theaters with 198 blackened seats. And it demonstrates rather clearly that the problem is severe and serious and one in five is a big number and perhaps uh, I have a family and I have a wife that I love, maybe I should seriously think about uh, redoing that. I wanna make a point with this graphic as well. We're not doing any of the research in our theaters. All we're doing is finding a way to communicate that information in a way that's friendly to both physicians and patients and enhances shared decision making. So patients should make the final decision from our, from our perspective. It should be based on values and preferences, level of acceptable risk. It should not be based on their knowledge of medicine or science. And I'd like to give uh, one more example before I, I turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Andy Lazarus. And I want to talk a minute about deceptive and misleading prescription drug promotion. Now, most of you who watch the news or watch any major sporting event, event sees uh, ads for drugs continuously. Unfortunately, these ads uh, are very deceptive. And although the FDA is very much interested in this and working on it, their progress has been a bit glacial. So deceptive claims and images distort health benefits and risks, and the healthcare industry has spent over 14 billion, that's B, uh, on advertising in 2014 alone, results in more expensive and inappropriate treatment, and the US and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that are allowed to uh, permit uh, advertising directly to the consumer. I don't know why New Zealand's doing it, I sort of know why we're doing it. And, and drugs that are currently advertised, you, you've all seen, and, and they, they start from, and if you can't read this graphic, it's not really critical, but they see Alice and Humira and Lyrica and Viagra and Eliquis and Celebrex. And Eliquis is one of the uh, um, 
anticoagulants that's being advertised today because there are over six million people in this country who have uh, uh, AFib, and these drugs are designed to present, prevent that. And what you see, and I won't show the video because of time, but what you see an Eliquis, um, that Eliquis is better than warfarin. And, and the, the, the problem is that um, Xarelto and Eliquis do exactly the same thing. And they both say that uh, there's a reduced risk from stroke when compared to warfarin, and that there's a major bleeding that's less compared to warfarin. Th these are the, this is what, it's what's in the ad, and this is what is stated further. They say that Eliquis uh, and Xarelto both prevent 20 more per 21 percent more strokes than warfarin, and 31 more bleeds than warfarin. These are relative numbers, and when you see relative numbers and percentages like this, the question should be 31 percent of what? And so the Eliquis ad it has no meaningful quantitative information except a few relative terms, only qualitative information. But the risks from taking Eliquis are, are pretty serious. Uh, there's an increased risk of stroke if you stop taking that drug, and Eliquis can cause serious and fatal bleeding, and Eliquis increases the risk of bleeding, and perhaps most importantly, bleeding due to Eliquis cannot be stopped. So if you're on Eliquis uh, and you bleed, uh, there's no remedy to it. It's all over. Now, this piece of information uh, doesn't get in incorporated into the ads, and that at best can be considered to be deceptive, but it would seem to be important um, to most everyone out here. And so in order to know what, what Eloquis is doing, you need to know what Warfarin is doing so you can subtract the two and, and, and come up with a difference. The ad doesn't talk about that. But the risk of serious bleeding taking Warfarin is important. The risk of stroke when taking Warfarin is important. And what is the absolute reduction when you subtract one from the other? So the bottom line here is it's a deceptive and misleading ad. And they don't tell you what the 21 and 31 percent means. They don't tell you what the risks and benefits of taking warfarin mean. They don't tell you how much Eliquis reduces the risk of stroke when compared to warfarin. And they don't tell you um, well, about the same thing about bleeding. And they don't, and, and they don't say uh, uh, whether it's true or not true that you can't stop the bleeding when Eliquis occurs. And, and this ad doesn't answer any of those final questions. And there are multiple lawsuits right now as a result of this, but the product continues uh, to get advertised. So, so what's really going on? And, and let's say someone comes into your office and puts down this ad and says, you know, I really want to go on Eliquis. I think it's better. I really want to go on Xarelto. I think it's better. Prodax, I think it's better. So the answer for, for Eliquis is here. There, there are two theaters. Um, the, one on, the one on your left talks about the 24% reduction of stroke, which I mentioned earlier compared to warfarin. What that really means is that if you look at absolute numbers, there are, there are two blackened dots. So there are two, two fewer disabling strokes, and they're both hemorrhagic. In other words, they have nothing to do with clots. They have to do with arteries splitting. So basically, the difference between Eliquis and warfarin is zero. And when you look at this theater, and those are the real numbers, there's also a 31% reduction in serious bleeds. And that difference has to do with a 1,000 a thousand individuals 20 compared to warfarin, which was 30. Unfortunately, and that comes to 10, unfortunately, additional studies, we wanted to be conservative here, uh, show that there's exactly the same number of bleeds. So at best, the information is uncertain. Now, if information were presented to a, a doctor like this, he could sit down with a patient and say, look, these are the numbers. And by the way, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, Eliquis is an order of magnitude by a factor of 10, more than an order of magnitude, more expensive than warfarin. And so the decision gets a little bit iffy, but the ad doesn't suggest any of that. And so you, you may want to look at other medicines that are advertised when you see them and look carefully for percentages and look for real comparative absolute values and, and comparisons and, and you won't see them. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn the uh, podium over to uh, Dr. Andy Lazarson. He'll, He'll give you a number of very exciting examples of, of everyday problems that, that you're well familiar with. I, I just dealt with a couple of these this morning. I, I, all I do is practice medicine. I'm not an academic. Um, I see patients all day, and I had two this morning, one with atrial fibrillation and another one with cholesterol that popped on my website, I mean my emails. 
we're dealing with this stuff all the time. Just, just to repeat a couple things, there's a huge amount of healthcare right now being spent on unnecessary testing. Uh, I just went to a conference last month where the keynote speaker said it's now up to a trillion dollars. And it's interesting that it's increased by about $300 billion a year without any improvement in outcome. In fact, more people are dying younger than they were before that $350 billion increase. A lot of it's in the cardiology field, too, interestingly. There was a study that looked at uh, increases in cardiology, and there was a $100 billion per year increase in cardiology costs, mostly from a, a screening stress tests and echocardiograms, which we'll get to. And about half of stuff that doctors do, like us, has low value. In other words, it doesn't help you get better, but we just kind of do it. Can empowering patients actually help reduce those numbers? We, we believe it. There are a lot of studies that would suggest it, but patients have a tough time of it. Patients are not given good information. If they're going to get their information just from their doctors, they're not always going to get accurate information. They get it from drug ads, if they get it from newspapers, it's mostly going to be relative numbers. If you look at a newspaper uh, article, especially a front page one about a drug or a procedure, you'll see it's always in relative numbers. And the, you know, to some extent, the BRCTs have helped me as a doctor overcome that barrier. So what we're going to do is kind of do a whirlwind tour of a visit to a doctor's office. And, and I'm going to talk about screening tests. The, these things can be used also in non-screening, for instance, in atrial fibrillation with warfarin. We have a lot of theaters. Um, dementia is a big one now. The, Medicare spends $11 billion a year on dementia treatment, $4 billion just on the drugs. And when people see the BRCTs in them, they're a little aghast at how much that actually accomplishes. Um, but that's patient-centered care today. Two guys looking at a computer, the patient in the middle. That's the patient being in the center. And that's, that's us. We're, we're, you guys know what we do. We're typing on computers all the time. Not our fault. We're told to do it. So let, let's talk about Mr. Z. Mr. Z comes in for an annual exam. And, and I have a lot of patients. He's 55 years old. I have people come and they want, their, they want to get checked out. And he's a social smoker and drinker. Um, doesn't tell you what that really means. Uh, he's, he's at the age where he's seen some illness among his friends. A friend had prostate cancer diagnosed. Another friend actually got a heart attack. And he's getting nervous. His wife's getting nervous. And he just wants me to check him over. And, and this happens very frequently. He's got a whole list he gives me. He wants his cholesterol checked. Um, and he wants to go into medicine to make sure that that's down if it's too high. He wants an EKG to make sure he's not going to get a heart attack when he goes running. Um, his wife wants him to make sure to tell him, I better do that prostate exam, which we've skipped the last two years, um, and that he wants a PSA blood test. And he just wants a physical exam on the whole body. Just do everything, doc, just to make sure I'm OK. Um, and, but don't, don't bug me about my smoking like you did last year. Really, I don't, I don't do that much of it. That's not, that's not important. I want this other stuff. We know what a value part of an annual visit is. And actually, a lot of it has nothing to do with what Mr. Z walked in with. Especially with me, the annual, the, the most important part that I could talk about with my patients is how they could live a healthy lifestyle. How they understand what options they have in terms of screening, in terms of medicines, what they could do to avoid coming to me. And that's a, a lot of what we should be talking about, but that's often gets lost in the clutter of testing and, and screening and examining. So Mr. Z wanted a physical exam. That's a theater, and you can see how many seats are in there. And just to know, the, the VA has done a big study on physical exams that has shown that there are some parts of a physical exam that are important that you should do. That, that doesn't have to be done by a doctor, by the way. But we do know out of 1,000 people who get an annual physical exam for their lifetime, compared to 1,000 people who don't, there's no life saved, there's no illness prevented. Uh, this big physical exam that people do is not necessarily life-saving. And we can go through every aspect of the physical exam. And I, when I originally put up the slides, I did that. I had listened to the neck, listened to the heart. We could do BRCs for all that. But we're not going to do that. I'll, I'm going to pick just a couple. Most things in a physical exam, including the physical exam itself, is called a screening test. Screening means you do a test with no symptoms. There's, there's no high level of suspicion that someone has disease, but you're going to do the test anyway. And a lot of those tests have false positives, much more than actual true positives, as we'll see. And that's the problem with screening tests. So if you, if you did a screening test on 1,000 people looking for a certain ailment, 
Um, you might find one person with the ailment, but you might find 10 people at a positive test that don't have the ailment. And that's what you have to jostle with. So let's talk about one exam that's kind of illustrative of, of screening tests, and that, you know, Mr. Z's wife wanted me to do this, um, putting the finger up and seeing how the prostate is. So what's the value of a prostate exam? The theater on your left shows that after seven years, approximately one death is prevented out of 30,000 screens. In, in this particular theater, there are no seats because you'd need a lot of theaters. You need 30 theaters with one dot to prevent one death. And even that is questionable. So what's the downside? Well, that, that's one person out of 30,000. Well, out of 1,000 positive screens, so I felt something on that exam, I better send you to urologist. You might need to get a biopsy. 700 of them proved to be absolutely nothing. There's nothing going on that even has to be followed. It was just a bad exam on my part or a lump that's been there for a while. And often these are typically biopsies, and biopsies can be painful. They could have side effects. But another side of this is the false negative side. And this is true of all screening tests. So of 1,000 people with prostate cancer, 400 have normal exams. So when I do that exam and I say, no, I feel nothing, and the, Mr. Z says, great, I don't have prostate cancer, it doesn't work that way. We miss a lot of stuff on these screening tests. So you catch a lot of stuff that is actually of not there, and you miss a lot of stuff that is there. And screening tests are inaccurate. And when I show Mr. Z these theaters, he's not that interested in me getting that, putting that finger up, which he wasn't anyway, by the way. But he says, what about, what about getting a PSA? You know, a PSA is a blood test that helps pick out prostate cancer, and my friend who just got diagnosed with prostate cancer, thank God he got that PSA because it saved his life. You know, they caught that cancer, and, and his doctor didn't even want to do it. So what's the value of a PSA? And by the way, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force said don't do PSAs a couple years ago, and now they said, well, talk about it at least. And when they said talk about it, all my patients said now they're telling to, saying to do it. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying you should have a discussion. So this was our discussion. Out of 1,000 people screen with an annual PSA for 13 years, depending on the study, somewhere between zero and one will avert a prostate cancer death. And we'll explain why that is. And, and by the way, these theaters help me to start a conversation. They are not the conversation. But they, give, they allow me to give patients information objectively that we could take the next step of the conversation. Same with, as with the, um, the prostate exam, there's a lot of false positives. So out of 1,000 people screened with it uh, over 10 years, approximately 150 to 200 will have a false positive. A high PSA just kind of hovering there. And you don't know what to do, so you stick in a needle and do a biopsy. If there's anyone here who's had a biopsy, I haven't, but my patients have. They don't like it. Um, 10 out of 1,000 people more than just don't like it, they actually have major side effects that lead to hospitalization from a prostate biopsy. So again, and these are people without prostate cancer who decided to get this test, and to prove they don't have prostate cancer, they get a biopsy and end up in the hospital. And again, the reverse is true. Out of 1,000 people with prostate cancer, 200 to 250 will have a normal PSA. So having a normal PSA does not excuse you from having prostate cancer. An uh, uh, example is a case of a Mr. R who I took care of recently. He was a 70-year-old man. Um, he wanted his PSA done after we discussed it, and it was, it was escalating. It was going up, and he was getting nervous, and he wanted a biopsy, and the biopsy showed he had cancer. So the, they actually did surgery to remove the prostate. He had some side effects from it. Um, wearing diapers now, uh, can't have an erection, but his wife is okay with that because it saved his life. Uh, and I, I see that a lot. I don't care, you saved his life. Thank God I'm the one who told him to get the PSA. Um, but did it save his life? One thing about these procedures is that they do have side effects that if you're gonna go down the road of ordering a PSA and saying how we're gonna treat a cancer if it's there, you really need to let the patient know what the implications of that treatment are. So, and this was the case with, uh, with the patient I just talked about. So of 1,000 people who get surgery, 200 will get urinary incontinence, which means they're gonna be leaking. They, they might be wearing a diaper. And who, people who get radiation, 200 will get rectal incontinence which is somewhat, in my opinion, worse from the patients I see, they're gonna have leakage from the back. Um, about 650 will get impotence. Out of, and so they have to know that going in. 
Um, and they might ask, okay, I'm gonna get all these things potentially, but if it saves my life, that's a good trade-off. Um, but are we sure about that? This is a theater of how many lives are saved. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is a theater of how many people die of prostate cancer 10 years after um, the diagnosis is made. So about 10 people out of 1,000 die of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is what we call an indolent cancer. And most people, it just sits there. It doesn't cause any harm. So finding it and treating it, in most cases, you find and treat something that actually was never going to hurt you anyway. The interesting thing about the study that looked at this is that that number 10 did not differ whether people had surgery, radiation, or did absolutely nothing. So the actual intervention that you're going to make is going to make a very small difference. What difference it did make, and I have a theater for this that I didn't put up, is there were fewer, there's less metastatic disease, disease that spread to bones, but that didn't translate to more death. So again, it's, it was, it's something I show people, um, like Mr. Z, when they come in, and a lot of them elect not to get this test. Some of them still do, but even if they do, I want them to know the implications when a test comes back positive of what they will do the next step. Prostate cancer represents 27% of cancers in men, um, leads to work loss, mostly from the treatment. Uh, it's relatively expensive, but it would be much more expensive if everyone did it. This is one of those tests that very few people are doing now because there's been a lot of bad press about it, and the bad press has been uh, quite accurate. So then he wants his cholesterol checked. And, and the, the, the little cartoon below kind of says it all to me. You know, he's, the doctor says, your cholesterol's the same, but the guidelines have changed. You know, so you're okay. That, that happens all the time. That just happened in weights now. I, I had to tell someone yesterday, I said, you weigh the same now, but last year, last year you were overweight, now you're okay because the guidelines have changed. So, so <laughs> yeah, this, we, and, and I, I, as a doctor, actually do not ever read guidelines. I mean, they're, they're not something, and I differ with some of my colleagues. The guidelines are just too fluid, and they're usually created by organizations that have some kind of stake in the guidelines, the you know, organizations of specialists. So as a primary care doctor, I like to look at the data raw and, kind of, and make, my, make my decisions about the data, and the patients um, have to be involved in that. So, and this morning on my news feed, there was a big debate among cardiologists again, should we be checking cholesterol in people? And the cardiologists were going crazy. We gotta check it earlier, we gotta get people on statins earlier, um, because disease is building up. And another, another cardiologist at the end, Rita Redberg, who's, who's big on Medicare payment, she's on the Medicare Payment Committee, she writes, she edits uh, at JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, said a lot of what I have down in this slide. We have no data that actually measuring cholesterol reduces the incidence of stroke, stroke heart attack, or death. There's not, it's never been said. And even the cardiologist in this article admitted that. They kind of said it makes sense, it should. But we have no data that it does. And there was a recent study that came out that showed that of 1,000 people who showed up for a heart attack, it was a scattergram of cholesterol. As many had normal cholesterol as high cholesterol. Cholesterol didn't seem to make a difference. And I try to explain that to Mr. Z. What's the value of lowering cholesterol? Cholesterol as a risk factor seems to have very, it's a very minor risk factor for heart disease. So out of 1,000 people with high cholesterol, over 280, relatively high, there's one additional death compared to 1,000 people with normal cholesterol. It's a very small risk factor. Out of 1,000 people who have a heart attack, there are no additional people with high cholesterol than with low cholesterol. So if, you're, if you want me to measure the cholesterol, why do you want me to measure it, I say to Mr. Z. He says he wants a statin if it's high. So we talk a little about the value of, of statin cholesterol medicine. And you guys all know what statin cholesterol medicines are. And, and uh, statin cholesterol medicines have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke, without a doubt. But it really depends on where you sit in your risk pool. So the risk pool means, do you have a lot of risk factors for heart attack and stroke? People who don't have a lot of risk factors for heart attack and stroke who take statins get very little benefit from statins. So out of 1,000 people with a low risk, approximately one will avoid a heart attack or stroke, and it's questionable whether any lives are saved. Once you get into moderate risk, which by the way, Mr. Z falls in that category because of his light smoking, then you're starting to get a higher benefit. So approximately 10 people over five years will avoid a really big bad outcome, which is a stroke, a heart attack, or death. 
Um, 10 people, you may or may not think is a lot. It, people who don't want statins are often not pushed by that number. People at high risk, the number jumps up to 45 out of 1,000. So 45 people out of 1,000 will avoid a stroke, heart attack, or death in five years. Some of my patients look at that and say, you know what, that's not good enough for me. Um, but a lot of them are compelled by that, especially since most of the theaters I show have one seat. So that, that's a lot of seats for, for a medical intervention. Um, here's the kicker. These numbers are not dependent on the cholesterol number. Whether you're low risk, middle risk, or high risk doesn't matter what your cholesterol is. So as I say to Mr. Z, checking your cholesterol doesn't change whether I'm going to put you on a statin or not. There's a whole, there are a whole other bunch of risk factors that we use for that. So I don't know. It, it, there is a, definitely a role to check cholesterol at some point in someone's life to make sure they're not an outlier. But beyond that, we do very little with the number. A patient of mine, Mrs. S, is an example of this. She's a 55-year-old woman, um, very active person, um, who had her cholesterol measured by another doctor before she came to me, and it was a little bit high, and the doctor put her on a statin. And the LDL went way down. So she actually started having problems that she didn't really attribute to the statin, but in retrospect probably were. Um, how high was her risk? We, we know she had a modestly high cholesterol, but she was an otherwise healthy person. So we know statins help people at higher risk. One way to, to check a risk in someone like this is to do something called the calcium score. Really cheap test, about 50 to 60 bucks. Um, takes a couple minutes. It's a form of a CAT scan. And if people, what the calcium score measures is how much calcium is in your heart blood vessels. And that corresponds to what we call hard plaque. And especially in people of this age, hard plaque, when it ruptures, causes a heart attack. So if you have no hard plaque, you got nothing for the statin to do. Statins work by stabilizing plaque. Their job in lowering cholesterol is, is at best ne nebulous. But they work by stabilizing plaque and preventing it from rupturing. So what if you have no plaque? What if you get a calcium score like she did and it's zero or really low? Well, it turns out your risk of having a heart attack in the next five years is, is virtually neg negligible. And if you go on a statin, it's still negligible. It's negligible plus a statin. So you really haven't changed it. So in a lot of people that I have, I will recommend this test if, they're, if we're not sure. If they're that low, medium risk, but the, checking the cholesterol doesn't change my calculus. And Mr. Z decided um, actually not to go for any of these things. Why not put statins in the water, like some of my cardiology colleagues suggest? Start them at birth, get them in the water. The problem is there are side effects from statins. Um, and out of 1,000 people who take statins, approximately 250 of them will suffer noticeable pain or weakness. I, I did this myself when I stupidly put myself on statins for no reason 15 years ago. And I'm a runner. And I, for that summer, even after I'd stopped them, I had to call my son to pick me up in the middle of the run several times, which I've never done since, before or since. And I realized that that's what was causing the problem. Um, also, about 400 out of 1,000 people will be noticeably tired. And I show these, no, these theaters to people just to say, look, if you're not any of these things, that's fine. But if you are any of these things, it could be from the statin. And either we could try to work on adjusting the statin dose, give you a different statin. But I, but I want you to be up front. I want them to be up front about this. And the reason is that a lot of people who would benefit from statins don't take them because they get side effects. And unless we're upfront about what these side effects could be, they might just stop the statin. I have patients who just don't tell their cardiologist they're not taking. The cost of cholesterol medicine in 2010 was 18.7 billion, it's, it's climbing. About 50% of people who take statins now do not need them based on calcium scores, based on the fact they have no plaque. Um, they, they're taking them just for high cholesterol, which again is not a risk factor. I just want a quick, a quick mention of Repatha. If, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but if you haven't, you will. $14,000 a year new cholesterol medicine that is an add-on to statins and has a big relative drop in, I think it's 25% drop in, uh, in heart attack um, if you add it on to statins. So the, the benefit is out of 1,000 people who take Repatha for two years, 15 will avoid a non-fatal stroke or heart attack, and no one will live any longer. I think in mo most 
companies that would pay for this drug are aware of these numbers, but I think it's important to show patients, you know, if you didn't want to use Repatha, why you didn't want to use it. It's, it's a very small benefit, and non-fatal strokes can be something that you basically walk in and out of an uh, emergency room that same day. But he does want to get a, an EKG. You know, an EKG is going to at least help him know if, if he's going to get a heart attack like his friend did. So EKGs and stress tests, and by the way, stress tests are one of the big drivers of, of the $100 billion of extra cardiology costs, and cardiologists do make a lot of money on a stress test, but they're very difficult to interpret. They have a high false positive rate and a very high false negative rate. Um, what about an abnormal EKG or stress test. Let's say you get a stress test and it shows some kind of problem. If, you, if this is someone who you did not take into account their clinical history at all, you didn't worry if they were a diabetic, smoker, had high blood pressure, had a family history. If you just went cold, then you would have, you'd find 20 people who you didn't know had heart disease, who actually have heart disease, that you could put on a medicine like a statin and, and help them reduce their risk. But assuming you take the, the actual history into account, studies have shown that if a thousand people get an EKG or a stress test, no one's gonna prevent a heart attack or stroke. Even though, the, in my town at least, the cardiologists do this every year on their patients. They call it a screening stress test. My patients say, That's, my doctor is thorough, man. He, he goes and does a stress test every year. And I show him the theaters, and it usually puts a break on it um, because of the next two theaters. Out of 1,000 people who get an EKG or stress test, 20 will suffer from an MRI uh, stroke or death who wouldn't have otherwise gotten those. How could that be? How could an EKG cause 20 extra people out of 1,000 to actually get a bad event? The reason is because of all the false positives, a certain bunch of people go for catheterizations. And when they get catheterizations, there are, there are sometimes bad outcomes. So that's where you're getting the 20 out of 1,000. They say, well, you didn't have heart disease and we are sorry for your stroke, but it might get better. This is, a, this is a, a, a theater that scares people the most though because it really gets to the meat of the matter of what Mr. Z wants. So out of 1,000 people actually have a heart attack, the day before that heart attack, approximately 800 to 900 would have had a normal EKG or stress test. EKGs and stress tests miss a lot of heart disease. And just when you walk out of a stress test thinking you're okay, you know, the old joke when I was, when I was training is if someone, you do an EKG on their office, you tell them they're good and they walk out and they drop, just turn them around so it looks like they're walking in your office. <laughs> so, you know, we, it's not our fault. And I, I, in, my, in my younger days, I was arrogant enough to tell people, I, you know, I did these tests, you're fine. I, I, told, I remember one man I said, you know, I did a CAT scan on him because he was losing weight and didn't show anything. I said, you don't have cancer, that much I could tell you. And he died of cancer two months later. You, you, you learn this the hard way. These tests miss a lot of things. Why do they miss things? Just, and again, these theaters help me engage in a conversation. So those are arteries. Um, there are three arteries there. The one on the left is completely clean. That has no plaque. That guy's lived a good, healthy life. And he has a negative calcium score. The one in the middle has got plaque all around it. At any point, that plaque could rupture and cause a heart attack. If you get a calcium score, you're gonna see that plaque. People at high risk almost inevitably have that plaque. People who smoke, people with diabetes inevitably have it. But if you get a stress test on that middle one, that stress test is normal. Because the only thing a stress test measures is blockage. So you could have vessels cluttered with plaque and have a normal stress test and think you're okay. The one on the right is the blockage a stress test will pick up. So then Mr. Z says, well, what if I got that? You know, what if I have that one? Shouldn't I open it up? I, you know, I could, my friend had a stent put in and just opened it up and that was fine. A patient of mine, Mr. L, had a stent, as I told Mr. Z. He came in to me with a cough. And we were working on why he was having a cough, probably a little acid reflux. But he did see his cardiologist just for his annual screening. He had nothing wrong with him. And they said, well, maybe it's an, a variant of angina from your heart. So he did a stress test, which showed that he had, and by the way, we knew this man had some coronary disease. He was on a statin and aspirin already. So, so maybe um, he, did, he had a, a stress test done. It showed 
It was abnormal. He got a catheter done. It showed a blockage of 70%. They put in a stent. They put him on two blood thinners. He had some bleeding. He's going to be on those blood thinners for another year, and that stent will be in with him forever. But he was feeling good. He said, look, doc, I still got my cough, so you got to fix that. Um, but my life was saved. This cough saved my life. But did it save his life? People, people who are asymptomatic, who get stents put in, there's a zero benefit. We know that. And that, those studies are pretty robust. That if people have no symptoms, if they have not had a heart attack, that no one benefits with a stent versus just going on a statin and an aspirin. However, out of 1,000 people who get a stent, 20 people will have a bad outcome. The stent could rupture. They could get major bleeding because now they're on two blood thinners. Or uh, as in the case of Eric, they might try to add a third. Um, so y the stent itself can cause problems. I didn't show this to my man with the cough. I I've learned never to show these after the fact. Ba it's a bad idea. But stents are very expensive. A recent study um, that said information we already know. About half the stents, at least, and that's conservative, have absolutely no value at all. The stents that are put in in the midst of a heart attack have value. Stents that are put in because people are in constant pain have value. There are stents, again, we're talking screening people who don't have any symptoms. Um, Bloomberg estimated $2.4 billion. Most people estimate much higher than that. And as we said in the video, most cardiologists do not discuss this. This is 75% don't discuss it at all. 97% in one study discussed it marginally, using relative numbers only. And when people did discuss it, people tended not to get stents for reasons that are pretty clear. So, so something that this man um, wanted, because I, I didn't talk to him about his smoking this time, but he said, you know, I know I smoke a little bit, and I know there's this new test, and that uh, my, my friend says it cuts down lung cancer death by 20%, and I'd like to get this test. It's a bunch of CAT scans. I get a CAT scan a year and 20% drop in lung cancer. You know, I smoke. I'm not going to quit smoking, but this, this is really good. I, I, I remind Mr. Z, what if he did quit smoking? I, I said, at age 55, 20, 200 people will avert death in 25 years at that age if you quit smoking. I remind Mr. Z that every theater I've shown him up till now, if you add up the benefit of everything he's asked me to do, has not had a single seat in the theater. But this one has 200 seats. And I also remind him that the side effect profile is pretty good of quitting smoking. But he, but he says, you know, I want this test. So we're going to do something a little different. You guys all have letters that you're given um, in your packet. A, B, C, C1, C, C, C. So I want to use these letters to kind of show you, you guys are a theater of a thousand smokers or former smokers. And you guys have all elected to go for this lung cancer screening, which every year for five years, you will go for a CAT scan. And we're gonna see what the benefit is. So anyone who has a C, C1, 2, 3, or just a C, stand up. So that, that's how many people have Cs. And the amount of people who have Cs are people that at one point in that five years are gonna to be told, your CAT scan is abnormal. You might have cancer. We're not sure, we have to do other tests. So anyone with just a C and no numbers, you can sit down. You guys, they, they looked over your scans, they did another CAT scan, it looks okay, but the rest of you guys were kinda of worried about. You guys might have something serious, so we gotta do other tests. We're either gonna do a PET scan which is a much more high radiation scan, or we're gonna do a biopsy to uh, figure out what's going on. And so we do that with you guys, and some of you guys do okay, and anyone who's C1 can sit down. Now the guys who are still standing, I got good news and bad news for you guys. The, the, the good news is, we'll find out later, you're gonna find out later you don't have cancer. The bad news is you're all getting either biopsies or surgery to figure that out. Um, and uh, so we'll do it by, a lot of people in this study actually had lobes removed to find out they didn't have cancer. And now anyone other than C1 can sit down. You guys got your biopsy, you got your surgery, um, you did okay. 
And the C1 people uh, of, sorry, C3. I got it wrong. C3, stand up. If you sat down, stand up. So the C3 people, of which there are a few, you guys had major complications from this, ended up in the hospital, you ended up with a chest tube, ended up with a respirator, came out of it and said, good news, you don't have cancer. Now anyone, you could sit down. You're done, you're safe, you're saved by the test. Um, anyone with a B? Anyone with a B? You guys, the B people, of which there are two, um, you guys had cancer found, and lung cancer, a lot like other cancers, there's a percentage of them that's indolent. It doesn't do anything. About a, one out of five lung cancers will just sit there. So your guys' cancer would never have killed you, but you got it removed. You don't know. Um, we don't know which ones are going to kill you and which not, so we remove them all. So you could sit down. Any A's? Any A's? Hey, there's the A. You can clap. This is, she, she, she had her life saved by the test. She had a cancer found that was actually not, uh, that would have killed her if had it not been found. We don't know how much longer she's going to live. It might be a year, it might be two years, but she did find a cancer that was potentially lethal that she found. And, and this is just kind of the theater in work. I, and it's important with these theaters to let people know um, and, and this is the cost, $9 billion a year. There's very little discussion, a lot of false positives. You gotta let people know what the false positives are gonna be. So in the theater format, th this, is, this is what the numbers look like. 20% reduction equals that. And a lot of my patients don't wanna go through this kind of thing. They get stressed, they, they don't wanna take a chance. A lot, of, and by, by the way, some people do. Some people would want to test like this, and it's really up to their own values. Some people say, my father is one of them. He would tell me, you know what, and I, that guy could be me. You know, I, I, don't want to, I, I don't care if I'm in the hospital for two weeks with a chest tube. I, just in case, that's like, I, and that's my dad. He doesn't listen to me ever. But my, my patients generally do, and it's amazing to me that I've been talking about this test for many years now, and I haven't had a single patient go for this test after a discussion, but I have had some people quit smoking because they'd rather do that than go through all of this. So there are some reasons um, that doctors and, values overvalue doctors and patients overvalue treatment. The availability um, heuristic, which means the tendency to base things on anecdotes, like Mr. Z was doing. Mr. Z said, I know this guy who had a PSA done and he got prostate cancer and his life was saved. That's half my patients are like that. Um, they're all saying that. Also, the oculostenotic reflux. And by the way, this stuff is all in the Atlantic article that Eric referenced, which is an amazing article. Um, but if you see a problem, fix it. It's kind of a surgical mentality. It's in there, fix it. And that's the mentality of the stent, which is, well, you got a blockage, open it up, makes sense. You know, why wouldn't it make sense? If it's closed, open it. And that's why it takes, most of medicine is more counterintuitive than you think. We did focus groups on, on this method, and I use them every day in my practice, but I've been just very happy to, to see how well they help patients to understand the risks and benefits. And by the way, it doesn't end the conversation. It, it's a part of the conversation, and it's a big part of it, but it, it leads to more questions and discussions. What's really important is we showed some of our patients um, bar graphs and things called number needed to treat, things with numbers on them, and they were very perplexed by all this stuff. The, the idea of having something that was actually something they could imagine being in was very important to them. So medical intervention is best explained using absolute numbers. I think Eric pounded that in. And when patients understand the risks and benefits, they actually can make decisions. And I believe that healthcare reform starts with the patient. Because when the patient is informed, the patient goes into a doctor's office, the patient is much more equipped to have a conversation rather than just being talked to, which happens far too often today. And when that happens actually with me, it, it is a much more satisfying visit and it leads to much better outcomes. If anyone wants to see, we do, we do these theaters on lots of, lots of new studies that come out. If anyone wants to see any of that, you could just log on. We're always, we're always trying to put something in the theater format. So thank you.
So we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Please use the microphones in the room uh, to, um, to ask your questions. And I'll start with mine. I can hear the cognitive dissonance in the room um, from people who uh, believed that things like an annual physical was the right thing to do. It's why many employers have them included in their benefit plan designs and, um, and their wellness programs. I mean, that's a requirement to get the incentive. You have to go have an annual physical as one example of many that you've covered. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how to uh, start to overcome the things that we now know aren't true about uh, what we thought was evidence-based best practices in wellness. I'll just tell you my, my own experience with the annual physical. And I, I, took care, I take care also of a lot of older patients. And it's funny what an annual physical is to different people. I'll often ask them. So a lot of my older patients say they want a urine test, they want an EKG and a chest x-ray. And they don't, want me to touch, they don't need me to touch them at all. Um, and if I don't do that stuff, I'm missing something. Other people want, you know, you know, my other doctor listened to my neck. How come you missed my neck? So part of the annual physical, to me, the annual physical is an incredibly useful way for a doctor and patient to have a discussion. But the physical part of it needs to be geared toward what the discussion reveals. There might be some parts of the discussion that make me want to do a physical in different parts of their body. But the discussion is key. So I like to view it as an annual, an annual encounter. I think that's really critical to have an annual encounter with a healthcare provider. But again, the physical as a screening tool, I tell them, I, I mean, how do I overcome it? I actually show them some of these theaters. I originally had the theater of the carotid neck exam, and you'd think, what's the harm of listening to the neck? And actually, more people have bad outcomes when the doctor listens to the neck when they don't listen to the neck for the same reason that we've said about everything else. The false positive rate's very high. Then they get an ultrasound, which also has a false positive rate. Next thing you know, they're getting a catheter up there. So, so it ends up leading down a road. And I explain that to people. Let's, let's be clever about this. And, and I also, in the annual exam, annual visit, like to really focus on health habits. When I talk about, for instance, the EKG, I will use that and I'll show them that picture I showed you and say, look, we don't want you to have plaque. That's what we care about. You know, getting an EKG, is not, getting a cholesterol check, that's not going to help us. We don't care how much cholesterol is in your blood. We care how much is sticking to your blood vessel. Let's talk about what we can do to prevent that stuff from sticking to your blood vessel. And that leads us to a discussion of, of healthy habits, which is so much more effective during the exam. So rather than just completely debunking the exam, I just kind of shift it to another direction. And I love the annual visit, so I, I, don't, I don't at all want to uh, uh, say that that's a bad thing. So Dr. Lazarus, actually, actually your response made me think of another question, which is um, the time it takes to have the conversation with your patients, show them the theaters, and probably talk them out of the things that they think they want. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it takes to develop the, the skill and the, and the knowledge, but also um, the time it takes to do what you're suggesting? If anyone has the answer to that, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's I, you know, what, one part of my life, I, I work on healthcare reform um, with several organizations, and we believe that primary care has is, is been given a short stick in the healthcare equation, that primary care doctors are few and far between now, um, that very few people are going into them, but more importantly, they are becoming factories for seeing patients, chug, chugging them out in 15, 20 minutes. And in 15, 20 minutes, and in that 15, 20 minutes, I gotta tell you, the insurance companies like Medicare, which I deal with a lot, make me put a lot of stuff in the computer. So I'm, I'm data entry during a lot of that 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, time is a big factor that we, we feel is absolutely crucial if we're gonna have this discussion. It, it's been shown that um, when there's a bigger primary care presence and when primary care doctors have more time, outcomes are substantially better. Time is the crucial element. With me, I, I've set up my practice so I do create more time. I, I have minimum 30 minute visits with my patients. And I, I've done that in a way by lowering overhead and doing other things. 
But I know that's the rare, that's the rare bird. Um, the other thing that gets in the way of shared decision making are clinical protocols. I don't know if you guys know what clinical guidelines are. You hear a lot about Medicare's changing because of quality and value, but the quality that they're putting on us is that we have to do a mammogram. There's no discussion. They grade us in how many of our women over a certain age and under a certain age have had mammograms. Discussion's irrelevant. So I'm also working on that aspect because that, that is completely antithetical to shared decision making. So we do have a great number of barriers as doctors to doing this. The way I, I've found these theaters have completely, um, have made it much easier for me. I show people pictures. I also give them the pictures to bring home. We'll talk about it later. I say, I just want to give you this information real quickly today. We're going to bring you back and talk about it. So I really don't think all this could be digested in one sitting. And, and sometimes the annual visit needs two parts. Anyone else have questions before we break? Yes. I, I have a quick question. Oh, and oh, please introduce on? yourself. Okay. Uh, Kate DeRoche from Open Notes. I was looking at your slides, particularly around the pharmaceutical, you know, your slide around the pharmaceutical industry. And you're taking on some very powerful stakeholders in the healthcare system. And I'm just wondering, how has your, your work been received by the larger medical community? And, and what types of things do you do to try to make sure people are really hearing what you're saying and not just focusing on their own bottom line? Well, one of the ways we, we try to get folks to understand is what we're saying is, is what we're doing today. And uh, your question about pharmaceutical companies, yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a tough call, but there are a lot of lawsuits right now um, that get rejected, in part because physicians uh, really don't know the difference between relative and absolute terms, and experts for pharmaceutical companies get, that get involved with these law cases use those terms and they're, they're assumed to be okay. Just de facto, they're assumed to be okay. But we feel that something like this can be a breakthrough where we can explain to judges and juries, <laughs> even notwithstanding what pharmaceutical companies say that, they really have no right to advertise products the way they do, like Xarelto and like Eliquis and like Pradaxa and on and on, because they're not being honest. They're not providing information on, on real risks and benefits and patients are being taken advantage of and they're bleeding and they're dying and that shouldn't happen. So I think there are openings if you can, if you can I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think there are openings if you can find them. Is that what you were asking? Okay, yeah. Just a quick, a quick follow up to that is, is that in, in my experience, trying to change the big players is, is virtually impossible. And that's why I say the key is that the patients get empowered. I, I think if we empower patients, they, they will make the change. And, and most people I know want the information and want to, want to be equal players in the uh, decision-making process. And nothing can do, the patient makes the final decision. Hi, I'm Amy Moyer. I'm the manager of value measurement at the Alliance. And we talked about the annual exam, but another very powerful force that we're seeing a lot of is this emphasis on wellness programs and frequently incorporating an aspect of biometric screenings into that. So, an annual panel of tests that are run on patients with, without discussion, sometimes with very powerful incentives for patients to have those tests. I'm sometimes concerned that we're kind of part of the problem there because of the over-testing, and I'd be curious on your thoughts on that. Um, you know, how to, how to go for early detection and go for wellness, but you know, what, what should we be doing in that area? It, where, uh, where I live, we have a doctor called the vitamin doctor. That, that's what I call him. Um, he does, I, and I, I know him because I've seen several of his patients who have switched over, and he does five or six pages of tests every year, blood tests. God knows what they are. But he owns a vitamin store on top of his office, and he looks at the tests and he sends them up to get a certain amount of concoctions that he has. And that's actually a relatively big part of his income. That, that prompted me to study this stuff. And, I, and we, have, we have a chapter in our book about supplements and also about screening, those kind of screening tests. And you know, I, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here, there's absolutely no evidence that that type of intense screening helps. They've been trying for years to find the right blood test to, um, to screen for heart disease. Whether it's the size of your cholesterol particle, whether it's a sedimentation rate, 
They keep trying. The first, first uh, study maybe shows some benefit. The next ones never do. We really have a hard time finding uh, the magic test to say if you're OK. So to me, the best screening is, is having a relationship with a provider and letting the provider know when there are changes, when, when some things are going wrong. There are certain screening tests that you have to talk about. Mammograms, you have to talk about. Colonoscopies, you have to discuss the risks and benefits. We have a theater and a colonoscopy. Eric looked at it and said, the heck with that. And I looked at it and said, I'm going and getting it. So you know, it, it depends on your own point of view as to whether you do it. But there are certain screening tests that at least have some evidence behind them, even the lung cancer screening, that you should have the discussion with them. All this crazy blood work that's often being pushed has absolutely no evidence behind it as to that it will change outcome. So yeah, I would, I've seen, I have patients who get the, some kind of corporate exam, and they come to me with a lot of pages of stuff, and I just, I just let's move on. That, that's all I can do. Hi, I'm Shirley Reif, and I have a question. Um, what you do seems to make sense. Any suggestions on how we might find a doctor in our area that thinks likewise, that we might utilize um, when we bring a doctor to our facility and offer you know, free wellness for our employees? How do we find that person or persons in our network that are close to us? I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, I, I think that uh, there are a few questions that people can ask doctors. And, and when, when a doctor says, you know, I think it's time for a mammogram, or I think you need a colonoscopy, or I think you need another screening test, and other forms of medical intervention, you could simply say, uh, why, do, why do you think so? Can you give me a chart in absolute terms that will show what my risks and benefits are? So most doctors probably not, not probably, most doctors won't or can't do that, but you should look for doctors that sincerely believe in shared decision making, sincerely believe that you're the one who should gonna, is gonna make the final decision. And, and I don't think that's an insurmountable uh, challenge. I, I know my wife uh, went through a couple of doctors that just were the opposite of that, and she found someone, and that person said, "Why you're in great health, why do you need this? Why would you be bothered with this? And I think you have to search them out and understand that the information should be available to you so that you can understand it. And, and what we're doing, we're not doing, I think I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating, we're not doing new research that people have to say, what the hell do these two guys know? Their, their research probably isn't as good as Harvard's research or Johns Hopkins research. That's not what we're doing. We're simply providing a method to communicate robust results in a way that patients can understand. It's very simple and straightforward. And the beauty of this thing is it, it's, it's familiar to people. They know they can see themselves in the theater. So you can, I think, take those basic concepts and, and look around for doctors that are amenable to them. And there won't be many, and it may be a tough job, but hopefully, and, you know, based on some of the things the Alliance is doing and organizations like that, it will get easier and easier because, because more doctors, I think, are receptive, and they're younger, and they're, they're more... Uh, willing to accept and understand the value of shared decision making. I'm not sure that answered your question, but. There might be a possibility of what you're saying, and maybe even through the rating system that the Alliance used, some sort of additional rating if, you know, doctors are identified as being a shared decision maker just to make, you know, our information more usable. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, my name is... My name is Ken Carlson. I work at a small rural health care provider. <clears throat> Dr. Lazarus, one of the things that I think you just said was that a relationship with a primary care physician is a good thing to have. Um, would that be correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, one of the things that we found with one of the employers that we work with is very low uh, rates of participation with the primary care provider. People just aren't interested in establishing that relationship. Um, and so... Uh, one of the things I was thinking about when you were showing the theaters is, do you have um, theaters that uh, show that might be a good conversation starter between a primary care physician and an employee of a business that show um, something like the advantages to healthy eating and exercise, sort of the opposite of the testing thing? Uh, so I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit. We, we, yeah, I mean, we do have some theaters that show that, which, and by the way, they're more difficult to determine. 
Mo most of the studies done on healthy eating are longitudinal studies. So like the women's health study that goes for 30 years um, looks at people who eat a Mediterranean diet versus non-Mediterranean diet and finds that on average they live seven years longer. But the, the big studies that are done on interventions are you know, universally financed by the pharmaceutical industry. And they don't want that study out there. I mean, there, there was a recent study that came out that was very small on dementia. And it looked at eating a Mediterranean diet, exercising and socializing, and they followed them for a year. And the results were outstanding after a year. You know, if you look at it, if you juxtapose it to the trials of dementia drugs, you'd, you'd fall down because there wasn't a comparison. But there is never going to be that comparison study done. So we do have theaters that, that more like the smoking theater that um, Eric showed, that showed, you know, amount of people that will be alive 20 years later. And yes, th and those are very compelling. Um, by the way, you could also, there are also theaters you can make because the data is very hard and very out there um, about the outcome of people who do see a primary care doctor regularly and those who don't, because there is a big difference in outcome. So that, that, that's another theater. I, and I, I think, unfortunately, what a lot of people have told me is the reason a lot of people don't see a primary care doctor all the time is because of the rush. You know, they don't feel like they're getting a real visit. They don't feel like they're getting a colleague who could help them through the healthcare morass. They're just getting someone who's typing in a computer. So part of that will change when, if we do actually have some real reform on that level. Excellent discussion. And um, uh, both will be back at the end of the session this morning for the panel discussion. But please join me now in thanking both of them for their comments. <clears throat>